Well, uh, I, I want to come out here, uh, first of all, to tell you that uh, Jay is prepared for all your questions and uh, is, is very much looking forward to the session. Um, second thing is uh, I want to let you know that uh, uh, over the next couple of weeks, there are going to obviously be a whole range of issues, immigration, economics, et cetera. We'll try to arrange a, a fuller press conference uh, to address your questions. Uh, the reason I actually wanted to come out today uh, is not to take questions, but uh, to speak to an issue that obviously has gotten a lot of attention over the course of the last week, uh, the issue of the uh, Trayvon Martin ruling. Uh, I gave a, a preliminary statement right after the ruling on Sunday, uh, but uh, watching the debate over the course of the last week, I thought uh, it might be useful for me to expand on my thoughts a little bit. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I want to make sure that uh, once again, uh, I send my thoughts and prayers as well as Michelle's to uh, the family uh, of Trayvon Martin uh, and to remark on the incredible grace and dignity uh, with which uh, they've dealt with uh, the entire situation. Um, I can only imagine what they're going through and it's, uh, it's remarkable how they've handled it. Uh, the second thing I want to say is to reiterate what I said on Sunday, which is there are going to be a lot of arguments about uh, the legal, legal issues in the case. Uh, I'll let uh, all the legal analysts uh, and talking heads address those issues. Um, the judge conducted the trial in a professional manner. Uh, the prosecution and the defense made their arguments. Uh, the juries were properly instructed uh, that uh, in, a, uh, in a case uh, such as this, uh, reasonable doubt was relevant, uh, and they rendered a verdict. And uh, once the jury's spoken, that's how our system works. Uh, but I did want to just talk a little bit about context uh, and how people have responded to it and, and how people are feeling. Um, you know, uh, when uh, Trayvon Martin was first shot, uh, I said that this could have been my son. Uh, another way of saying that is uh, Trayvon Martin could have been me uh, 35 years ago. And when you think about why in the African American com community at least um, there's a lot of pain around what happened here. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that um, the African American community is looking at this issue through uh, a set of experiences and a, and a history that, uh, that doesn't go away. You know, there are very few African American men in this country who haven't had the experience of being followed when they were shopping in a department store. That includes me. There are very, very few African American men who haven't had the experience of walking across the street and hearing uh, the locks click on the doors of cars. That happens to me, at least before I was a senator. There are very few African Americans who haven't had the experience of getting on an elevator and a woman clutching her purse uh, nervously uh, and holding her breath until she had a chance to get on. That happens often. And you know, I, I don't want to exaggerate this, but those sets of experiences inform how the African American community interprets uh, what happened uh, one night in Florida. Uh, and it's inescapable for people to bring those experiences to bear. Uh, the African American community is also knowledgeable that uh, there is a history of racial disparities in the application of our criminal laws. Uh, everything from the death penalty to enforcement of our drug laws. Uh, and that ends up having an impact in terms of how people interpret the case. Uh, now this isn't to say that the African American community is naive about the fact that African American young men uh, are disproportionately 
involved in the criminal justice system, uh, that they're disproportionately both victims and perpetrators of violence. Um, it's not to make excuses for that fact, uh, although black folks do interpret uh, the reasons for that in a historical context. They understand that some of the violence that takes place in poor black neighborhoods around the country uh, is born out of uh, a very violent past in this country. And that the poverty and dysfunction uh, that we see in those communities uh, can be traced to a very difficult history. Uh, and so the fact that sometimes that's unacknowledged uh, adds to the frustration. And the fact that uh, a lot of African American boys are painted with a broad brush uh, and the excuse is given, well, there are these statistics out there that show that African American boys are more violent. Using that as an excuse to then see uh, sons treated differently causes pain. I think the African American community is also not naive in understanding that statistically, somebody like Trayvon Martin was probably statistically more likely to be shot by a peer than he was by uh, somebody else. Uh, so, so folks understand uh, the challenges that uh, exist uh, for African-American boys. But they get frustrated, I think, if they feel that there's no context for it. Uh, or, and that context is being denied. Uh, and uh, and that all contributes, I think, to a sense that uh, if a white male teen was involved in the same kind of scenario that from top to bottom, uh, both the outcome uh, and the aftermath might have been different. Now, the question for me at least, and, and I think for a lot of folks is, uh, where do we take this? How, how do we uh, learn some lessons from this and, and move in a positive direction? Um, I think it's understandable that there have been demonstrations and vigils and uh, protests and uh, some of that stuff is just going to have to work its way through as long as it remains nonviolent. If I see any violence, then uh, I will remind folks that uh, that dishonors uh, what happened to Trayvon Martin and his family. Uh, but beyond protests or vigils, the question is, are there some concrete things that we might be able to do? Um, I know that Eric Holder is, is reviewing what happened uh, down there, but I think it's important for people to have some clear expectations here. Traditionally, these are issues of state and local government. The criminal code and law enforcement is traditionally done at the state and local levels, not at the federal levels. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that uh, as a nation, uh, we can't uh, do some things that I think would be productive. Uh, so let me just give a, a couple of specifics that uh, I'm still bouncing around with my staff. You know, so we're not rolling out some five-point plan, but some areas uh, where I think all of us could potentially focus. Uh, number one, precisely because law enforcement is often uh, determined at the state and local level. Uh, I think it would be productive for the Justice Department, governors, mayors, uh, to work with law enforcement about training at the state and local levels in order to reduce the kind of mistrust in the system that sometimes currently exists. Uh, you know, when I was in Illinois, I passed racial profiling legislation uh, and it actually did just two simple things. One, it collected data on traffic stops uh, and the race of the person who was stopped. But the other thing was it resourced us training uh, police departments uh, across the state on how to think about uh, potential uh, racial bias and 
ways to further professionalize what they were doing. And initially, the police departments across the state were resistant, but actually they came to recognize that if it was done in a fair, straightforward way, that it would allow them to do their jobs better and communities uh, would have more confidence in them and uh, in turn be more helpful in, uh, in applying the law. And obviously law enforcement's got a very tough job. So that's one area where I think there are a lot of resources and best practices that could be uh, brought to bear if state and local governments uh, are receptive. And I think a lot of them would be. And, and let's figure out are there ways for us to uh, push out that kind of training. Um, along the same lines, I think it'd be useful for us to examine some state and, and local laws to see if it if they are uh, designed in such a way that they may encourage the kinds of altercations and confrontations and tragedies that we saw uh, in the Florida case, uh, rather than diffuse potential altercations. Uh, I know that there's been commentary about the fact that uh, the stand your ground laws in Florida were not used as a defense in the case. Uh, on the other hand, if we're sending a message as a society in our communities that uh, someone who is armed potentially has the right to uh, use those firearms uh, even if there's a way for them to exit uh, from a situation. Uh, is that really going to be contributing to the kind of peace and security and order that we'd like to see? Uh, and for those who uh, who resist that idea that we should think about something like these stand your ground laws. Uh, I just ask people to consider if Trayvon Martin was of age and armed, could he have stood his ground on that sidewalk? And do we actually think that uh, he would have been justified in shooting Mr. Zimmerman uh, who had followed him in a car because he felt threatened? Um, and if the answer to that question is at least ambiguous, then it seems to me that we might want to examine those kinds of laws. Um, number three, and this is a long-term project, uh, we need to spend some time in thinking about how do we bolster and reinforce uh, our African-American boys. Uh, and this is something that Michelle and I talk uh, a lot about. There are a lot of kids out there who need help, who are getting a lot of negative reinforcement. And is there more that we can do to uh, give them a sense that their country cares about them and values them and is willing to invest in them? Uh, you know, I'm not uh, naive about the prospects of some grand new federal program. I'm not sure that that's what we're talking about here. But I, I do recognize that as president, I've got some convening power. And there are a lot of good programs that are uh, being done across the country uh, on this front. And for us to be able to gather together business leaders and local elected officials and clergy and celebrities and athletes and figure out how are we uh, doing a better job uh, helping young African-American men feel uh, that they're a full part of this society and that, um, and that uh, they've got pathways and avenues uh, to succeed. You know, I think that would be a pretty good outcome from what was obviously a tragic situation. And we're going to spend some time uh, working on that and thinking about that. And then finally, uh, I think it's going to be important for all of us to do some soul searching. Um, you know, there have been talk about should we convene a conversation on race. Uh, I haven't seen that be particularly productive when you know, politicians try to organize conversations. They end up being stilted and politicized and uh, folks uh, are locked into the positions they already have. On the other hand, in families and churches and workplaces, uh, there's the possibility 
that people are a little bit more honest and at least you ask yourself your own questions about uh, am I wringing as much bias out of myself as I can? A am I judging people as much as I can based on uh, not the color of their skin but the content of their character? That would, I think, be a, an appropriate uh, exercise uh, in the wake of this tragedy. And let me just leave you with, uh, with a final thought that uh, as difficult and challenging as uh, this whole episode has been for a lot of people, uh, I don't want us to lose sight that things are getting better. Uh, each successive generation uh, seems to be making progress in changing attitudes when it comes to race. Doesn't mean we're in a post-racial society. It doesn't mean that racism is eliminated. But you know, when I talk to Malia and Sasha, uh, and I listen to their friends, and I see them interact, uh, they're better than we are. They're better than we were on these issues. And that's true in every community uh, that I've visited all across the country. Uh, and so, you know, we have to be vigilant and we have to uh, work on these issues. And those of us in authority should be doing everything we can to encourage the better angels of our nature as opposed to uh, using uh, these episodes to heighten divisions. But we should also uh, have confidence that uh, kids uh, these days, I think, have more sense than we did back then, and certainly more than our parents did or our grandparents did, and that uh, along this long, difficult journey, uh, you know, we're becoming uh, a more perfect union, not a perfect union but a more perfect union. All right? Thank you, guys.